Our thanks for staying with us. 2020 might have left very little hope to hang on to, but the world is still in motion as amidst the chaos, many have found their diamonds in the rubble and many more will. Yes, COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and economy. It has also brought new opportunities as there are emerging investment trends in various sectors. To survive 2020 and beyond, one must position themselves and leverage these opportunities. Now, processes are changing, new industries are emerging, and money is changing hands. Flexibility, automation, and sustainability are just some of the words that will make all the difference in the world of business today. And remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waste Your Africa One with the hashtag Waste, or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. So before we bring our guest in quickly, two minutes, um, Tammy, what do you think is happening to the business world right now? You know, so um, more particularly, I'm just interested in talking about um, investment opportunities in primary agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very big on agriculture, um, essentially anything that helps us diversify the economy mm -hmm. away from oil, you know, and I know it's top of mind for a state government as well. We saw the rice mill and, you know, dairy farm and all mm -hmm. of that. So it'll be interesting to see because there's a gap in the entire value chain yeah. and for every gap, that's like a potential investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So whether it's storage or processing or transportation, it would just be interesting to see um, what? what's available and what yeah. we can do what we can and what do. we should be looking at, essentially. Yeah. How about you, Nasa? Well, so um, for me, businesses post-COVID or effects of COVID is to explore uh, more innovative ways of doing things. You know, the landscape's changed a lot, as we know, and people are now more... Um, should be more open to doing things differently and just embrace the Absolutely. new normal, as they call yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. if you've not even thought about doing things differently, now yeah, is the that, time. Yeah. Right, so let me bring in our guest. Now, Akin Tunde Oyebode is an economist and financial, finance professional. His career of almost two decades spans different institutions, including Stambik IBTC Bank, where he was the bank's pioneer country head of SME banking. In 2015, he joined the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund as its pioneer executive secretary slash CEO, where he was responsible for designing and implementing Lagos State government's job and wealth creation strategy. In three years under his watch, LSETF supported small businesses, some small businesses, and enabled the creation of over 100,000 jobs. Now, in 2019, he voluntarily left his role and joined the Ekiti State Government as Special Advisor and Director General of the Ekiti State Development and Investment Promotion Agency, where he is leading the state's drive to attract domestic and international investments. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Welcome That's to the show. You know, <laughs> we're so happy to have you. That's is like, yeah, yeah, so. like well, you know, yeah, when I read the TV and I saw voluntarily, I said in Nigeria today, <laughs> one must really emphasize voluntarily because m not many people like you left Lagos, you know, <laughs> Lagos <laughs> to Ekiti, Lagos to the New York, but not really, <laughs> not like you were forced out of it, you know. But I, I, I must commend that because not many people have that, um, that liver. Let me, let me use the local word, the lever to do that. But sure. thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. All right, so um, investment. Um, where are we at you know, in Nigeria in terms of, are there really opportunities or this is, um, you, know, you know, everybody's saying that because with the COVID-19, a lot of things are changing and there are many opportunities. Do we really have those in Nigeria? Or we are just following on both people to say there are opportunities that we don't have it? <laughs> So, I mean, you're asking me a question that you should be asking um, <laughs> Ms. Sadiku, Abio. the Executive Secretary of the NITC. Um, but I, I think that yeah, there are macro challenges, yeah. and there are definitely things that as a country we can do very differently and do better. Yeah. So I'll be the first to admit that we could, of course, think about our monetary and fiscal policies a bit differently um, and use that to improve liquidity in our foreign exchange markets, for example, um, or some of our investments in agriculture, instead of investing directly by lending money to farmers, mm -hmm. investing in infrastructure that enables better productivity. So, for example, things like research, things like irrigation, uh, which ultimately lifts all farmers, right? So, so there are things we can do differently. Yeah. But I, I mean, I still don't think it's all doom and gloom. Um, I mean, I've seen the Q1, we've all seen the Q1 GDP numbers. Yes, there's a 6.1% contraction, but it could have been, it could have been right. significantly worse, mm -hmm. right? So. I do think that the informal nature of a lot of Nigeria's economy, and in a way, the limited impact of the lockdown, 
you know, moderated some of those, uh, some of the numbers you've seen. But yeah, they're clearly, I mean, out of all of this trouble, you know, ICT is still growing at 18% year on year, right? Mm -hmm. So it does tell you, you know, all your Zoom calls and all your yeah. Microsoft team meetings working and all those home. things and working from home. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's an impact on how well we can leverage technology. Yeah. And I think we've talked about it a lot. You know, now there's, this is now like, it's, it's, it's pretty much brought it forward, right? Mm -hmm. How quickly, you know, we can, we can build the workforce to, to take advantage of these opportunities. But I still think that even with all the uh, challenges, there's still opportunities within the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me, you want to go? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I'll start off from, I mean, agriculture, tourism, all of that is just dancing around in my head. But agriculture um, specifically. Um, I know that we have that bountiful, um, you know, juicy, uh, ripe yeah. red tomatoes, you know, in Joss. And in this same country, I know they've stopped that now, but we still used to get foreign exchange that we did not have to import tomato paste from China. You know, and so that just tells you that there's a breakdown somewhere in that value chain. So what can we do differently? What is the state government doing um, regarding agriculture? I mean, with job creation, um, being able to, you know, feed ourselves and self-sufficiency, you know, both at the national and the state levels, right? So what do you think we can do differently? What opportunities are there in that agricultural value chain? So is this where you get to interview me <laughs> on TV? You know, you know, like, just for people to know what opportunities exist and what we can harness and see if know. we can put money <laughs> to... <laughs> Where we should invest. I, I was just asking because I thought she was trying to <laughs> pay me back for some of the things I, <laughs> that he has done that I've done to her, interviewing her. Some of our viewers that don't know, they have a long standing relationship. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I think, look, it's a great question, right? So, I, 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 like I said earlier, I think there's some things we can do differently. Yeah. I think we can invest in irrigation, um, we can invest in, in research, you know, so improving the quality of inputs. Um, improving, ensuring that we can plant and farm all season. So if you look at today, the maize harvest today, this year, is threatened. And not just maize, across Heavily multiple threatened. crops, yeah, right? Yeah, so cassava as yeah, well. Yeah, so like cassava, very... maize. So because the rains haven't come, right? So you are, you are very, so this is rain-fed agriculture, right? Rain-fed agriculture has limitations. Yeah, yeah, at the mercy of, of Mother Nature. Um, and that's where I think that we can invest a lot better. So when people talk about things like storage, I don't think storage is primarily a problem because if you get the right inputs in, you can standardize the outputs, right? You can build the, 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 the value chain, so you can build the processing infrastructure close to the farmlands, so you don't necessarily need that. Much. So for something like cassava, for example, cassava has to be used very quickly, right? So farm to, to factory, it's like ours, very, yeah, right? So, so, so you don't really, so storage is like a problem that you face down the line. The problem we have is if you, you talk about tomatoes, right? Mm -hmm. The challenge is you can't really guarantee the quality, mm -hmm. right? So if you need a hundred tons of tomatoes, you're not really sure you're gonna get hundred tons of tomatoes that you can take through your plants because the farmers are not using similar inputs, right? The farming right. methods are fairly different, right? Everybody is doing their own thing, right? So that's the problem. The problem is we can't scale agriculture. I don't think that the solution today is necessarily in banning everything. I think that is, I think for example, my view is that macroeconomic policy, price stability has to be where we nail ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to impoverish people because you want to increase productivity. What you do is you subsidize the things that drive the cost up, right? And you make it very difficult for imports to compete with, with local products, yes. right? Okay. What that does is that it, it's a disincentive to importation. Absolutely. So what we must ask ourselves is why is it possible for rice to come from Thailand or China, and right? And it's still cheaper than and the rice that we produce rice. here, right? So that's the question we need to, so that's what you need to unpack. And I think that that's where the investment opportunity is in the long term, right? So today in my state, for example, we have three rice mills coming on stream. But the work that we're also doing is ensuring that it's not just rice mills. Mm -hmm. Where's the paddy, right? So it's building the capacity of the farmers to plant all season, right? Such that they can feed the paddy to serve those mills, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's how you start to drop costs, right? Well, because cost cheaper price. input, yeah. you, you understand your soil types. Mm -hmm. You understand how to plant. You understand the seedlings. That give you so if you imagine if you move your 
productivity from two tons per hectare mm -hmm. to eight tons per hectare, right? That's feeding directly into the cost of rice. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's where the investment opportunity for as government is. But for individuals, right, I think that the real opportunity is saying, what crops do we have processing capacity that needs feedstock? Now, cassava is a great mm -hmm. one for me. Because cassava is used for starch, cassava is an adhesive. It's um, uh, also alcohol, ethanol. So yeah. ethanol, right. the farmer companies, mm -hmm. for example, you need farmer grade cassava. Yes. Now, what you will find is that if you are producing that today in Nigeria, I mean, I know people who are who are uh, who are suppliers to large FMCGs. They can't meet their orders, yeah. right? Because the the the, the processing facility in the country is nowhere close. Right mm. to meeting demand, so so those are areas where you. But of course, with some of these things, you need significant amounts of capital. You know, mm -hmm. if you are coming to invest in oil palm, right? This is not a honestly a hundred, two hundred thousand naira business, oh, right. right? So so it, it, it there's a significant that. capital requirement to do these things at scale. You know, so before the NASA call, yeah. I just want to um, to just help you to, to tell you that that's what we are facing. So we are farmers. Mm -hmm. We have a oil palm, um, palm plantation. And we did sweet corn that mm -hmm. some people yeah. ordered. So because the corn was so nice, we had mm -hmm. orders on ground. Plant. You know, we planted. I can't even tell the clients now. We planted because of this water challenge that we're having. We just finished um, doing a proper irrigation system because all the things we planted mm -hmm. completely, we couldn't sustain it because there was no water. So whatever he's saying is a direct impact to farmers. We we are suffering it, and we we must truly invest in that you know that irrigation process okay, wow. yeah go ahead Nasa. okay so um Aki, it's my question will be around what's happened happened with covid like globally and how historically like it's reported that countries tend to look more inwards when mm -hmm. these sort of things happen mm -hmm. so obviously you expect more protection protectionist policies mm -hmm. and i'm thinking so we're saying investment opportunities but are there foreign investors that are willing to come into nigeria based on these sort of policies that currently everybody all countries are sort of probably now embracing and what does this also mean for trade which is an area that you're also specializing in and innovation so i think you know it's it's not really more of protection protectionist policies mm -hmm. the problem is that the supply chain is broken mm. right so when you institute lockdowns right you can't move goods and services as well as look it's as simple as when you institute lockdowns there are people who go into factories mm -hmm. Who move those pallets out of the factories onto the trucks? There are truck drivers who drive those trucks to the airports, who get them onto the cargo planes, and who get them across countries. Mm -hmm. Now that process is entirely broken. Mm -hmm. So what you find is one of the things that this it actually puts Nigeria in play. This is my my, my mm -hmm. hypothesis, right? So you find that people are going to say we cannot continue, right, to move all our production to one market, right? So the country we shall not name, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there, there's, there's some concentration risk around certain, certain locations, yeah. right? So if there's, a, if, there's, if there's a breakout of something in country C, right, or country I, mm. where do we go? Now, this is where I feel that we need to start investing in early stage education, right? That's for me is where the rubber mm -hmm. meets the road, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you take things like business process outsourcing, for which I'm the patron saint, I'm happy to say that, Nigerians speak relatively toneless English, right? Yeah. We operate in a GMT plus one time zone, right? So it means that we can serve Central Europe, we can serve all these markets, right? But you need people who can do the work, right? So that's where education comes in. You need broadband mm. to be able to deliver. Because one of the things, if you run a call center, the one thing you are not allowed to have is drop calls. Mm -hmm. Right? You need the broadband infrastructure. And that's what we're trying to build in Ekiti with our knowledge zone. Right? And that's why we dropped right-of-way uh, charges from what was 4,500 naira per linear meter to 140 naira per linear meter. And we even said to you, wow. you, don't, you, you don't even have to pay it up front. Mm -hmm. right? We can batter that. So you can give us broadband. You don't have to pay dime. Mm -hmm. The reason is that we need broadband into our knowledge zone. Right? We're working today, I mean, I'm not at liberty to mention with who, mm -hmm. but we're working today with one or two local uh, technology companies to add some uh, courses into the curriculum of our universities. Now, they might not, you might not earn any credits for taking those courses, but they at least develop you for the workforce, yeah, skills right? That you need yeah. Because then you need to yeah. build an army of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people. Look, I always tell people a story, anecdotal story. When I was at the Employment Trust Fund, you know, I sat across this Israeli guy who said to me, you're trying to pitch us to come to Lagos to set up a customer service center for Microsoft. And what he wasn't saying to me that I felt was like, if this thing fails, I'm going to have your right hand, right? Mm. 
He came in and said, I want to hire 200 people. They got over 1,000 qualified people. He said to me, if this thing works phenomenally, I'm going to hire 1,000 people over three years. They are less than two years in Nigeria. They've got over 1,000 people. Mm. They are operating in Victoria Island, expensive real estate. But the numbers still add up for them because the talent is there. Wow. You see, one thing I tell people about Nigeria is that, yes, we don't have the educational system to build this thing at scale. Mm. But you know when you are 200 million people, right? Even if you have 2% of that pool as a, as a, as a well-resourced talent pool, mm -hmm. 4 million people is a lot of people. Absolutely. Right? So when, when people say to me, when they talk to me and say, your state in Nigeria, I say, hold up, wait. My state is bigger than X number of countries. Mm. I know, you know, right? So let's situate this correctly. <laughs> right. you know? Absolutely. Um, so those numbers mean that if you actually get education right, mm. you know, if you move from 2% to 20 the reason people go to India is not because they love India better than Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's because they know that if we deploy capital here, we are likely going to optimize the return on capital. Capital goes where it's wanted, mm -hmm. right? So those are the things where I think that we can do better on, right? Mm -hmm. So broadband for me, if you ask me what should we be, what infrastructure are we focused on, power is the one we all know, right? Mm -hmm. We hope that this presidential power initiative at least starts to solve the engineering problems around power. Mm -hmm. For me, the biggest one is broadband, Absolutely. right? You must get connectivity across this country. Without okay. a doubt, that's the one thing that we need to get done. Absolutely. All right, so we'll take a short break <laughs> and we'll still have Akin with us. Please stay with us. We'll be right back.